Okay, hi. Um, this is um, Zalando speaking from Berlin, Germany. Um, this is my colleague Luis Minero, and my name is Sean Floyd. Uh, we'll be talking today about uh, a specific API, and it's going to be this talk will have two parts. It will be a sort of my part will be more organizational, um, how things happen on an organizational level that affects development. And his part will be more on the um, hacky DevOps side, oh, how, how can we actually get this thing to work? Uh, so we're uh, trying to, to cover this from different angles. So first we're gonna start with giving, uh, giving you a, a bit of background uh, to uh, who we are. Uh, I guess most of you have seen our website or something, but uh, we've actually talked to some developers, so nobody has an idea what we are when it comes to technical terms, so to give you some, some numbers. Um, we, um, uh, we, ha we have online stores in 15 countries, we have three fulfillment centers, we have many, many customers, we make a lot of money, uh, we have, which is good, yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> It hasn't always been that way, but now it is that way. Uh, and we are big. We have 8,000 employees, and uh, we, uh, that's all of Zalando. Um, but in technology alone, we have uh, 800, 900. We're opening tech hubs. Originally, we're from Berlin, but we're opening tech hubs in Dublin and Helsinki. We've already had Dortmund for years. We are trying to open tech hubs all over uh, the place in Europe. Um, we are hiring massively. But we'll get to that. Okay, so our scale. Um, we have um, uh, originally uh, we have our server standing in two data centers um, uh, with um, thousands of servers running at any given time, both uh, fronted servers, Tomcats, and um, solar servers that uh, give us our article detail. I think the, the number is 600 solar servers running at any given time. Um, so we're used to um, scaling uh, massively. This is how our um, infrastructure traditionally looked like. We have, um, um, you see in the, in the upper left corner shop, um, that's the part you guys know. Uh, that, that's what, what you see. It's, it's a small part of, or probably the mobile side, hopefully. Uh, um, the mobile app you also know. It's, it's a part, uh, a small part of our landscape. We have, you see the, uh, to the left of it, we have the, the, the massive solar farms uh, I, I talked about, but uh, most of our infrastructure comes from our, um, our back end, which is uh, traditionally uh, mostly using uh, Postgres databases. Um, some of that will change, but that's where we come from. We're, we also have our own logistics warehouses. We run the, uh, those warehouses completely. We, we write the software that runs those warehouses, and we uh, staff them. We build that warehouses, everything. So um, a lot of that is uh, pretty huge on a massive scale. So this is, uh, so the, the two of us are coming from a Zalando shop perspective. And the Zalando shop is, you know, I mean, we sell stuff. Originally, we used to sell shoes, then we sold more and yeah, it's a lot of cool stuff. And this is what it looks like. That's the Spanish version. Um, but we sort of have to look at what's behind that. What, what, what's behind it if you actually look at uh, from the other side? Usually, when you look at things from the other side, it doesn't look that pretty. So, um, uh, what we have right now is a monolith. Yeah. It is um, a big um, um, bunch of code. Uh, actually, there's a trend these days um, where uh, to, when you have a monolith, you give it names. We heard, like for example, SoundCloud call their monolith the mothership. We call our mon uh, monolith Jimmy, um, and um, and we will. Um, so we are actually in the process of uh, getting rid of Jimmy, but um, that's not in the scope of today's talk. But we do need to touch on uh, Jimmy because Jimmy is uh, a bit like this. Uh, there is um, a lot of spaghetti, as you can see. Um, there, uh, we, we have several thousand um, Java classes in one monolithic web app. We have thousands of features that nobody even knows we have. Um, something that somebody uh, requested three years ago and the product manager has long left the company. We have no idea why it's there, what it does. Yeah, you name it. 
Um, we have business logic on all layers, unfortunately. We have business logic in the database. We have business logic in the solar. We have business logic in the web front end. Everywhere. It's infested everywhere. So, yeah, messy data. Um, so, then, now uh, we're traveling back in time. It was 2013, and actually, um, we're here to um, evangelize Zolando, and that's what started in 2013. We were starting to evangelize Zolando, so we wanted to go uh, to hackathons. Uh, Zolando wanted to uh, sponsor hackathons, and said, well, well, I mean, we need a REST API. Um, well, we have all that data, let's just expose it through a REST, a REST API. And well, the, the developers will basically have this uh, reaction. Uh, that that's not really uh, something that you can easily turn into a REST, REST API, because a REST API is usually um, uh, structured in a, in a clear way. There shouldn't be a business logic in a, in a REST API. It's just uh, CRUD, basically. Show, you, show me your data. Um, so how would we? Uh, solve this. The first thing we did was we created what we called our hackathon API, um, which was basically this. So we already had a Spring MVC application, and we just said, oh, well, we'll, we'll just write some more controllers in there and make those controllers look REST like. And um, we will actually deploy our soft, uh, software, the Jimmy Monolith, to a different place, expose it under, uh, under a different URL and just hide the fact that there's actually a shop there. Uh, just sort of expose different paths, nobody knows which, uh, um, how to call the, the other endpoints, and we're good, we have an API. Uh, worked for one hackathon. Um, no, it did work, uh, but eventually it was something that we couldn't be proud of. Um, um, so, I mean, the, the, the easy part was the infrastructure is already there, it's just, yeah, just, just, just code some controllers, we're all set. Um, but, uh, it's, it, it felt um, kind of um, strange. I mean, yes, it couldn't be um, deployed independently of our, our shop. And as I said, we had business logic on all layers. Um, um, just, I, I think we'll get into, get into that a bit, uh, a bit later. But um, uh, then, uh, so we were actually thinking about that and then suddenly, new requirements came up uh, because then our bosses said, oh, we do have a hackathon API, let's use, use that for some, some other stuff. I mean, we can, uh, our bosses are not like that, I know. Yeah, but, Worse. Um, <laughs> um, so, we, um, so some new requirements came, uh, came in. Um, Oh, we uh, our our front end actually needs an API to uh, to call. Why, why can't we use that also? So, um, uh, I mean, our front uh, front end JavaScript. We have very cool JavaScript guys, and they want they want to do some some stuff with our backend data, and they need an API for that, and that's absolutely valid. But this API was never designed for that kind of uh, thing. And then also we're starting to negotiate business models with third party companies who actually want to use our data to create their own uh, apps and. Yeah, sounds like a good idea, but in the scope of this thing, okay, mm, could be difficult. Okay, so we said um, what we were uh, going to do is we'll start a new project that's actually called the Shop Public API, and um, we are going to deploy it as a separate standalone project. We're going to expose the shop's data, but do it without the shop code. Uh, but yeah, the shop's data is a lot of different things. So basically we had to cover all these dependencies. Um, yeah, the main thing, the data comes, the catalog data comes from the solar. Um, stock data uh, is kind of real time from memcache. Then we have the, the, the reviews, the, um, the basically, yeah, uh, the, the issue is, ah, uh, no, it's too big, nah, nah, yields are kind of high and all of that. It's, uh, it's in, the, in the reviews, we have that in the dedicated server, uh, service. Um, and then there's a the recommendation. Oh, you, you bought this shoe? Oh, okay. then you definitely need, need this handbag also. And that, uh, all, uh, that also comes from, um, uh, from a different API. And then some of our business logic is actually using our um, Postgres database. And now we have, um, yeah, so basically we have this, ah, now that's all in the data center. Um, but it should be no problem. We just, I mean, we, we're in the same data center, no problem. We can access all of that. But then came the next, um, 
paradigm shift. Um, because suddenly, in the beginning of two, uh, 2015, uh, we said we are now a tech company. We are no longer a fashion company, we're a tech company. So basically, we used to be a fashion company that knew a lot about tech, and now we're a tech company that knows a lot about fashion. Um, so um, our new mission statement is to um, open ourselves as a platform um, and, and make all of our infrastructure available uh, for, for other companies to, to use it, to sell, sell their stuff uh, on many different um, different levels, so you can basically pick and choose um, all of our services. They're not there yet, but we will we'll get there. Um, so to do that, we actually established uh, five principles by which we work, and I'll go into uh, a bit of that. So the first one is API first. Um, we will actually um, um, write our APIs up in a format like Swagger. We've, uh, we've actually agreed on, on Swagger. If you as a team want to create an API, you first have to write a Swagger specification and get it approved by, um, uh, we have, we call it API Guild, a group of people who are actually very into Rust APIs. And um, as soon as you have it approved, then you can start writing your code. You cannot do it any other way. That's, that's the central, central um, contract here because APIs are going to be what we will be exposing to the public and we want the APIs to look in a way that um, uh, we, we can live with them and we're not making any compromise there. Okay, going back, the, these are the New Zealando principles. Going back to our shop, public API, we were already working on that and we actually did pretty much that. We actually did uh, develop it with Swagger before we wrote the code and so we were kind of good there. Okay, the next principle is REST, which obviously we were also um, uh, good at um, in, in the shop public API. So basically, you know, the rest, uh, don't do RPC, uh, uh, deal with resources, embrace HTTP verbs, do not expose verbs, expose nouns. Um, we had been doing RPC for, for years or so, but we do, had done RPC mostly in SOAP, um, and so for us, it was a complete paradigm shift. Well, that was actually fine. We were uh, very cool with that. Then the next principle was uh, software as a server. Um, uh, basically, yeah, expose all of our uh, different uh, software components. The, the entire stack you saw earlier, uh, the nice drawing, uh, should be um, exposed as, as APIs. But we can't do that uh, right now because our identity management strategy isn't ready yet. That actually took us, it's, it's still an ongoing process. Our backend services that, uh, haven't exposed those APIs yet. And um, yeah, so right now we can only expose read-only features because all those services are not there yet. So our shop API, we'd love to have interactive features. We can't because the, uh, the upstream um, APIs are not there, are not there yet. Okay, uh, and uh, the next one is microservices. Shop. <laughs> what? Oh yeah, true. <laughs> I wasn't there in that talk, but yeah, uh, true. Um, so uh, the principle is microservices, and here is actually where we have a disagreement uh, because my buddy Louis says, "Oh, we were doing microservices all uh, all the time, uh, even even three years ago. Uh, all our existing SOAP infrastructure, all of that was already microservices." Um, and I'm like, "Yeah, well, hmm. to me that was more like a service-oriented architecture traditionally." And it was, those sort of services weren't really micro, but you can argue about what's, what's micro, but yeah. Um, and the, f the fifth principle is cloud. Um, so we will actually, as a company, move everything to AWS. And that's where things get interesting, because if you recall, earlier I talked about our dependencies, and there was this guy saying, oh, no problem, we're in the same data center. Suddenly, we're not in the same data center. So some challenges ahead for our shop API. Our backend services are not in the data center, uh, are not in AWS, they are in the data centers. Same goes for solar. Uh, and uh, we cannot move the databases outside the, um, uh, outside the data center. So how can we solve that? This is how we, where we hand over, right? Yes. Okay, so, sorry, this is gonna be complicated. Yeah. If you have any questions while we do this, go ahead.
was the introduction about a lot of the paradigm shift I mentioned, all the stuff. Um, and then I was actually in charge of some of these challenges and what we can do there. Uh, uh, because we started immediately looking at all of those data sources, if you remember. Do you want me to go back to that slide with all of the data sources? But you guys remember catalog, stock information, reviews, recommendation, and a database. So there were a lot of them. Um, from all of those, we actually identified that these two in particular were latency critical. So actually going over the internet to access something that we could waste 30 milliseconds should not be a problem. But for the catalog and particularly the stock man cache, this was not acceptable. Because usually we get less than one millisecond response time, adding 30 would not be definitely an option. So, besides, they are all owned by different teams, so they have their own roadmaps. We cannot just go there and easily coordinate that move as one single uh, uh, unit to the US. There was also another problem, which was um, we still have to run the internal infrastructure. We still have to run Jimmy in the existing data center. Downtime, right? Everything needs to happen without anyone noticing because you need to make money. Um, so, can we solve that? Uh, yeah, I think we could. I think we can. So, step one we move the critical data sources to AWS, right? It should be easy. We just move them. Yeah, latency critical, we move those. But we can't just move them. Because <laughs> uh, Genie also needs them for the data centers, as I said, right? So, the shop is still running there. Jim is running there, so moving is not an option. So we need to replicate them over the data to us. Then, well, replicating data sources. Solar already has a, its own replication mechanism. We unfortunately still run Solar 3. It's pretty good. We have our own custom setup. So we have awesome performance there. That's actually what's keeping us there. Because we don't see any real advantage. We benchmark often if the new version could actually offer anything extra, but so far so good. And it's not actually the relevant part, because that solar has a good replication mechanism over HTTP. This just works perfectly over the wire, should be fine. And memcache, memcache should be easy, right? No, it's not at all. So, step two, we have to build a memcache replication solution. Uh, and this, actually, this was one of the first uh, projects that we built for this particular purpose. We built a stock relay. This was actually uh, using Nebby and uh, implementing the memcache protocol. And what it does is that it accepts the three basic commands, the get, set, and unit. For the get, it actually proxies all of that to the real memcaches, local memcaches. Just in case it gets a get request, it actually proxies to the real memcaches which hold the information for stock, and then we send it back. But for set and delete, what we do is actually to serialize that, we send it over to an SNS topic. I hope you guys know what SNS and SQS is. So SNS is PubSub on AWS, it's their service for PubSub, and SQS is message queuing. Good. The way they make PubSub work is to have a topic where you send stuff, and then you attach queues as consumers. And this is exactly how it works. So we push that to this particular topic uh, in Frankfurt, region, which just opened last year. We push that, that topic, and then we have queues subscribing on each different region, in the United States, in Ireland, and in Frankfurt. And actually, we could also have it in Asia if, if we wanted, but we don't have that many customers. Over there. So actually, not even in the US, but we sponsored the tech crunch, so that was also relevant. So and this is basically what it does. As soon as we are on AWS, we have those message queues, and then we have uh, tiny Python thing which just consumes really fast from those message queues locally, and then drops that to local elastic cache, mem cache, the uh, setups that we have there. So each region has its own mem cache cluster, and there we just basically replicate over the wire. This is probably getting around 18 million events uh, per hour, which is a very good throughput, and it's a very good setup. So, and this is working, this is clearly working. So, then the shop only KPI, which was actually running in our internal infrastructure, it just connects to memcaches, like it is, it was doing internally. So it's quite transparent for the shop public API. This was done transparently there. So shop public API still connects to memcaches and gets real-time stock information. 
not all. <laughs> so then, the last part, if you remember, I mentioned that Solar already has its own replication mechanism, right? So over HTTP, you set up a master, and then you set up slaves, and then it just replicates everything. It keeps folding every now and then. If there is a new index version, if there is a new index version, it will just replicate that data. Download a bunch of files, reopens the indexes, and starts serving requests for those new indexes. This is also pretty much the setup. So the one to the left is our, our data center master. Good enough. I mean, it runs on powerful hardware, so we have good internet connection. So then we have, uh, on the AWS side, we have the repeaters. Repeater is actually nothing new. I mean, this was already established even with Solar 3. Basically, you set up a Solar instance, which is both a master and a slave. It's a slave in the sense that it replicates from this one, but then it's also a master because it can have then a slave farm replicating from itself. This is actually the only possible way to scale solar massive, because at one point the network connection between your slave farm and the single master just exhausted. So you have to put repeater layers. And this is what we do. But of course, we only do it across the overall internet once to reach AWS. So we have one AWS master repeater in the island region, going to the west one. And then the other regions actually replicate from this region because it's already on the AWS and traffic between the AWS is not the best. It's a bit faster. It's not that fast, but it's faster. Uh, and then we actually have the same thing. We have a standard setup of solar slaves replicating from these local region repeaters, which they think they are masters, so they just replicate, and they are auto scaling groups. So we define some thresholds, they scale up, they scale down. But of course, the shuffle API is itself in auto scaling groups, it scales up and scales down. So when the public API is scaling up, because it's having, getting a lot of requests, this will trigger eventually the alarm in the auto scaling group for solar and it will scale up. Um, which is in detail, this is exactly this is what I was going through. So two auto scaling groups, you have the api.salama.com, everyone can use it, and then you need the load balancer with the auto scaling group for the API, depending on which metric we define, this auto scaling group from AWS will just put more instances or remove instances, depending on the track. This, on, its, on the other side, will of course use the solar farm using another load balancer, which has its own auto scaling group, which will also put more solar instances and remove them. This requires some details. Actually, a couple of years ago, also here in Barcelona, Eric Erickson uh, demonstrated how this could be done. Because Solar has some particularities. You cannot just put an instance in the load balancer if it hasn't replicated at least once. Because it has an empty index. So you don't want an empty instance serving requests in your load balancer, or else it would serve zero results. So it requires some tweaking, but you can actually check it. And he actually provided the solution for this. Disable the load balancer until you have a signal that the replication is finished at least one. Then everything is fine. And this is actually a setup that could work, but it was not an hour scale. At our scale, as soon as you start triggering auto scaling, scaling up, scaling up, scaling up, remember, we still have only one region repeater. And that group doesn't cope with all of that. So eventually it also burns completely. If you keep adding slave, 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 eventually even the network interface is not going to be enough. So, why doesn't it scale? Um, and then we were actually forced to come up with solutions for this problem. And this is basically where we started being creative about it. Uh, one of the approaches, the one that is actually in production right now, is, is, is this one. Uh, we thought that, hey, if we are transferring index files over the network, over HTTP, well, S3 does that, right? We could file the HTTP files over HTTP. Well, what? Can, can work. It actually does. It does require some tiny details because um, S3 applies some weird rate limiting as far as bandwidth goes. So if you have multiple cores, big ones, which have like 5, 10, 20 gigabytes of data, it will actually throttle down the bandwidth. So the trick here is split your cores. Bring up more slaves, more repeaters with just one core, 
make the index size around one, two gigabytes, the NFT is going to, it's going to be fine. But if you actually have huge cores in the same EC2 instance, they will be going to throttle down the bandwidth and then it's going to be And this is also what we do. So we still have this uh, AWS master repeater, but what it does, every time it gets a new index from our data center master repeater, it pushes the new index on S3. That's what it does, individually. This is also a good setup um, because then we can have separate teams consuming replicating from this S3 bucket so they get the cost for themselves because each team has its own AWS account. So we are just putting the, the master index there in our S3 bucket and then they replicate the, the, and the requested page, and this option for the requested page. Um, and then we basically use S3 feature if you enable versioning and replication, it requires both. You enable versioning, you enable replication, and automatically AWS is going to do this for you. So everything you file in that bucket is going to be replicated to the other region. So we have another bucket in the US, we have another bucket uh, in Frankfurt, and Amazon is taking care of this, they just replicate. This makes it really easy for as far as operation goes. It does require though that we have our own wrappers around Solid, because Solid doesn't know anything about this. So we have to do it ourselves. So I guess this is not only a bit cheating because we are just using AWS, uh, it also bounds you to AWS. I mean, you are forced to use AWS because only they provide S3. Uh, so we, at the same time, we're actually working on another solution. Um, this one is actually conceptually possible to do everywhere else. Uh, it's definitely not as simple as the other one. And actually there's a lot of orchestration around this concept of elastic environments, auto-scaling, DNS, and metrics. Uh, so, the setup is basically like this. I'm trying to simplify, so now we are already on, on the AWS, because that's where the problem was. We have the, the AWS master repeater, and we have the slave farm replicating from that, right? So if you grow too much this layer, it will eventually destroy this one. Because you have too many slaves, and even the network interface is not going to be enough. So what it does is, in front of the existing layer, it starts with layer zero, and then you have your orchestration group and your slave farm. Uh, and then you have this DNS teammate, which is just repeated. Repeated dot whatever domain that you decided to use with um, And this is basically what it does. You start with layer zero, you have a C name pointing repeated to layer zero, and you have your slave farm always replicated from the repeated dot solid program. Uh, then what you do, as you usually would do, you use CloudWatch and you set up a couple, a couple of metrics that will trigger alarms. So this is actually what the autoscaling groups for AWS do. They trigger an alarm and then the autoscaling group reacts to that alarm, either adding more offices or shutting them down. Um, you set up a couple of metrics, could be network, could be CPU, it's actually depending on your setup. Right now we are monitoring the network different because it's the one that we know will exhaust first. So we are monitoring the network bandwidth, and you need some uh, slack space here. Yeah. So you cannot trigger the alarm at 80% of the network. Because what you need to do next can probably take five minutes or so. Including because it actually depends on the DNS TPL. So you configure that stuff and you configure a copy. So instead of because we don't have an office can go for this particular purpose, when the alarm is triggered, you send a notification to SMS. And then, on the layer, which is Java, it is listening on those notifications. And in the notification, there is everything you need. Uh, and this is what it does. Eventually, the application, which is getting the alarms from CloudWatch, will get the notification saying, you reach this condition now in alarm. So the network bandwidth is already 60%, for example. This means scale up. And what it does, keep in mind that the current slave farm is still replicating from Dot solid. Okay. So what this will do, it will bring up a completely new layer of repeaters. So we have layer zero, we started with layer zero, and this thing creates a completely new auto-scaling group called layer one. So current layer plus one. And it creates it, repeating from the previous layer. So current layer plus one, replicate from current layer. And this is how this new group comes up. But it's still just there. It means that the slave farm is still actually replicating 
compute layer zero, because the C name is still pointing back now. After it's done, after that layer is ready, and it has graphic data, we just change the C name. Now we just instrument DNS, and DNS, the C name repeater, is not pointing to layer zero anymore. It's pointing to the new current layer. And that, then it actually does a pyramid. So you have your master repeater, then you only have two or three instances immediately after it, and then your slave file, which is continuously growing, is now replicating from three possible repeaters, not only one anymore, which means that now you triple or triple the amount of bandwidth to replicate. This one is a little more, more complex. This is why we are not using it right now in production. Uh, it does require a lot of tuning from CloudWatch uh, metrics, and even ourselves, we haven't really reached the sweet spot. It does require a lot of effort. But the concept at the end will fit for anything. It's not only about solid, because you bring these things in front and you keep extending with the edges and you put stuff in between to actually conceptually move this for the other things. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't published any of this yet. Uh, major reasons because we have to think about licensing because we are a German company and we have to consider a lot of practice to open source all of this stuff, but it is going to be open source. So any of those solutions, the wrappers for solar using S3 and this onion tool, tool all of them open source. That's it. Thank you for listening. Uh, I actually invite all of you to visit our blog, our tech blog. Uh, we are going to show the slides, I believe. Um, uh, we also have our own company GitHub account where we have a lot of open source projects, a lot of cool stuff in there, so please go and check it out. Uh, particularly, I'd like to point to the Stoop stack, which is our uh, solution for auditing and compliance on top of AWS. Pretty cool. It's actually worth a talk, but we don't have our talk uh, team here. Um, yeah, yeah, so if you have any more questions, um, you can reach us on Twitter and we are good for you. Yeah, plenty of time. Right. Good. Any questions? Go ahead. Yeah, my microphone's coming out. I can repeat them as well.
And we've been around, we already met a bunch of you guys, so you will find us there. Okay. No further questions. Okay. Okay. I know that one. This has changed a lot over the years. Um, traditionally, we had a, um, a separate QA department. Um, so actually, we would be we had we had a life cycle where um, yeah, classic. Um, oh, I write my code and I hand it over to QA, um, and then QA tests tests the features. So that was the testing from the outside. Of course, we were always writing unit tests. At least we were always supposed to write it. Uh, but as you see. In the slides, the code was very spaghetti, and spaghetti code is also a non-testable code. Um, and so we used to not be very good at writing unit tests. In previous about two years, we got a lot stricter about code architectures, and we said, well, um, if your code is not tested, if it's not testable, then it sucks. Please rewrite it in a way that you can test it and write unit tests. So we wrote a lot of unit tests. We wrote um, uh, integration tests, mostly in the case where we uh, interacted with the database. Um, for um, in cases where we interacted with other servers, we would use uh, acceptance tests, automated acceptance tests that came from the outside, so that would run on a de deployed server. It could be yeah, going through Selenium, uh, which is a nightmare, but yeah, um, uh, but it's, it's still necessary. Um, our um, our front end teams. Used, used Cucumber a lot, but I'm, I don't really know, uh, I'm not in the depth of Cucumber, so I can't really explain that, but we have lots of different uh, different uh, uh, test strategies. But now we have actually have the, the new organizational changes where um, uh, now we don't have a separate QA department anymore. We actually uh, have this um, um, concept that's called radical agility, where we actually have individual autonomous teams that are responsible full stack for uh, for their product, so, which means also for testing it. So we no, don't, no longer have um, separate testers. We have um, uh, the, the former test engineers um, that we had in QA basically have two options. Either they become regular developers, they join the teams, and they, they share their knowledge, they share the testing knowledge with, with the developers, and the developers share their uh, production knowledge with, with the testers. Uh, or if they don't want to do that, then they, uh, we have we also have a centralized unit that does site reliability, um, chaos monkey testing, etc. And, um, and, and so they can also go uh, go there. But um, basically, we have we we um, with our autonomous teams we um, uh, embrace uh, DevOps. So your um, the, the, the teams are. Um, responsible full stack for deployment, uh, for operations, everything, and also, of course, for uh, for testing. So nobody can say uh, anymore, oh, I just do the code, you just do the testing. That, that, doesn't, uh, that doesn't scale, and uh, we basically, um, um, and also there is no unique testing strategy. Yeah, because so, a lot of people. Exactly, yes, so um, part of this radical um, agility movement is also each uh, team gets to decide how they do it, and that's uh, what technologies that they use, uh, how they, um, uh, where they host it within limits, as long as it's on AWS, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, and um, but also, what is their testing strategy? That's actually something that each team has to define on an individual level. And we have uh, the business assurance team, which is the, the sort of the, the team that has these chaos monkey guys, etc. And they provide consulting services to the individual team uh, to help them establish their test concept. But eventually, the team itself is responsible for testing, and it's usually it's a kind of a ping pong setup. Okay, today I'm doing the coding, you're doing the testing, tomorrow it will be the other way around. Something like that. Okay. Any more questions? 
will be alone. Okay? Thank you. Okay. Thank Thanks you. a lot.